in our hobbies, you sometimes end up meeting people you regret. Not just regret meeting, but regret that you're forced to live in the same world as them. Regret that you both can somehow share some joy in the same activity. Regret that you both have shared the same air. I managed to stumble upon a gathering of these types. With circumstances keeping me from fleeing, I ended up spending a weekend with them. My friend makes a bad decision. He's a good guy. Just as long as you don't let him decide anything. As long as someone is deciding things for him. There's no problems. But the second he's left to his own devices, he will almost always come up with the absolute worst idea. His exploits are carved into his body with burns and scars from the dumbest of accidents. And he's even missing part of his ear thanks to an infection he got from trying to pierce it himself. Sadly, I'm not too bright myself and often forget that I'm never supposed to listen to any of his suggestions. So when he decided we should join a fantasy LARP, I agreed. We, my bad decision-making friend, and one other, and myself, had gone LARPing in the past, way back in high school. It was pretty bad, we were too young to know that. We ended up going for six of the monthly events, which was how long it took for us to understand the LARP and to figure out just how bad it was. The way it worked was that it really only made sense to go if you had already been going there for years. We stopped going once we realised just how slow the character progression really was, and that it would take us roughly three to four years before we would be above peon status, and another three to four years before we'd be a little below average. While this may not be a problem at other LARPs, it meant that we would be doing nothing but running for help whenever there was a problem for all that time. While the other friend and I had abandoned it, my misguided friend continued a bit, going to events every once in a while still chasing the dream of eventually gaining enough power to be able to go outside the inn without having to ask people to come along and protect him. Eventually, even he stopped, mostly because he didn't want to keep paying the fee. A few years later, he managed to catch wind of a new LARP that had just launched. An off shit of the original one started up by disgruntled members who were tired of the bullshit of the first. He was excited about it and kept talking about how they were going to change things and make it better. I knew it was just going to be the same old problems in a new package, and decided not to go. While at first I was adamant about my refusal, his enthusiasm was rather contagious, especially because each month he'd come back and would not shut up about how awesome it was. Eventually my memories of the previous LARP started to blend with both nostalgia and wistful thoughts on how I had hoped things would have gone. The other friend, the one who had gone before with us, ended up giving in first and agreed to go to it about a year after it had started up. With no real reason to not go beyond a bad previous experience at a different LARP, I decided that we might as well all go. As we drove to the campsite where the LARP would take place, the three of us slowly converted back into our young high school days, filled with innocence, optimism, and that childlike love of fantasy and pretend. We decided to get into character, starting off with only referring to each other by our character names. The friend who had been going to the LARP for the past year was Hargill Nightwater, a mage. The other friend planned on reviving his old character, Lith Cloud, who was a hardy warrior. I decided on reviving my old character as well, Nephim Festiva, who would use both magic and weapons. Hargill kept telling us about this and that, and how awesome everything was. He gave me tips on what the good magic spells were, and explained little nuances about the way combat was handled. Since the system was fairly new, not everything had been really ironed out, and even Hargill said he didn't really think he had figured it all out by now. Lith kept discussing plans on reviving our old adventuring party, Cerberus, and maybe even spending enough time and effort into eventually turning it into a noble house or clan. When we arrived on Friday afternoon, things seemed pretty good. In fact, the campground seemed awesome. They were some distance away from the closest town and had plenty of wooded areas as well as flat fields. I was still filled with optimism and barely could wait to go out and adventure and roleplay. I lost a lot of that optimism very quickly with the very first person I saw. High Lord Olsic. <laughs> there we go. Or at least, that's what he called himself at the old LARP. An overweight man in his late 40s or early 50s. He would braid his hair and beard in a way I assume he thought he was very medieval slash fantasy looking, but instead looked like he had just come back from a teenage girl sleepover. He always looked like he was scowling, except for when he made eye contact with someone, when he would open his small eyes wide and give the most unnatural smile a person could give. He was responsible for some of the worst, including the very worst, memories at the old LARP. 
He had been a noble and enjoyed ordering around people, especially during the big battles. Disobeying him was apparently a huge offence and he had actually incarcerated Lith in the little fake jail room for leaving his position during a big battle. Lith had rushed out to help Hargel, who had somehow been left out in the open, which created a gap in the line the enemies took advantage of. He spent two hours in that little room before I managed to convince other nobles to release him. And even then, only after he took almost all of our gold. As High Lord Ulsic ambled over towards us, I cast a sideways glance at my friends, with Lith appearing rather passive. While somewhat disturbingly, Hargel seemed rather happy about seeing Ulsic. With his loud and forcedly gruff voice, Ulsic greeted Hargel and then asked who we were. Having forgotten us in the many years since we had last met, we introduced ourselves anew, and while I did it so I wouldn't appear rude by saying we had met before and he had simply forgotten us, Lith did it because he had completely forgotten the man. Rather quickly, Hargel changed. Talking with Ulsic, his voice and mannerisms became more and more exaggerated until I could barely recognise him. Using lofty and often silly sounding language with complete seriousness, I had to strifle a somewhat mean-spirited chuckle at his earnest role-playing. I then realised that the event hadn't actually started yet and that neither Ulsic nor Hargel were actually in character yet. Lith seemed to be paying attention to their conversation, but I was more interested in the other people that were arriving. A parade of various outcasts, most of them were male in their 30s, a handful of teenagers kept together in clumps here and there, and eventually people in their 20s began to appear. Most were overweight, while the expectations were exceptionally thin. Judging purely by appearance, it didn't seem like neither me or Lith would have any real athletic competition besides each other. Even Hargel, who was somewhat out of shape, could probably challenge most of the people there to a fist fight and have a good chance at winning. After everyone, a large amount, probably over a hundred people, had gathered around the parking lot, we made our way to the large main cabin. It had already been decorated with candles and various fantasy materials, probably taken straight out of a Halloween store and we went through the registration process, which included being assigned our cabins. Lith and I had to make our characters, and I was pleased to see that we had a fair amount of options. With the amount of points you started with, you were able to choose different abilities. Lith made a straightforward warrior, specialising in one-handed sword and a large shield style. He went mostly for raw statistics, increasing his HP all the way to 22, and spending a fair amount of points to raise the damage of his sword to the next level from 3 to 4. Overall, it seemed solid, if a little generic. I tweaked around and ended up with primarily a mage that could also use a two-handed sword. 14 HP seemed like it was a bit low, but it was better than 10 HP other starting mages typically had, and the two-handed sword dealt a solid 4 damage even without raising it to the next level. As for my spells, I decided on two offensive fire ones, one that dealt 1 damage but I could use it as much as I wanted and one that dealt 7 damage that I could use once a day. I also picked a nice spell, one that made my target forced to stand in the same spot. He could move his arms but not his feet, and a healing spell I could use 3 times a day to cure 4 HP. To use a spell, I would say the spell's name, then throw or touch my target with a small bean bags of various sizes, some only an inch long and wide, while others were the size of my hand, while most fell somewhere in between. When we had the character finished and registered, we went over to Hargel, who was with three other people, including Ulsuk. The event had not started yet, so everyone was still in their everyday clothing, and they were discussing the game itself. I listened in, and discovered a few things that I probably would have liked to have known before I came here. As told by Ulsuk himself, he had played a vital role in starting this LARP, and wasn't merely a player, but a partial owner and one of the three head plot masters. Also, it seemed that during this event, Harjo was actually going to become a noble, a count, who would serve beneath the Archduke Ulsic, who was using the same name as his character from the last LARP. Lith was very happy hearing this, because it meant that the adventuring party Cerberus had already taken its first steps towards becoming a full-fledged noble house. The event started after an hour, with dinner. By that time, everyone had changed into their costumes. While me and Lith wore what could barely be called costumes, and there were some teenagers who shared our shirt and pants fashion sense. Everyone else had elaborate costumes and makeup, robes, capes, frilly shirts, full body paint, and there were even two people who wore wolf fur suits. <coughs> they were playing a werewolf type race. I barely recognised Hargel, dressed in a purple robe with a full cape and a hood, 
and an odd rune-like shapes painted on his face. He also must have not recognised us as he walked past both of us as he headed towards a different table. Feeling somewhat miffed about the cold shoulder, we walked over to him. He told us that he and his noble house had some plot related things they needed to discuss and that he wasn't allowed to tell us. This was understandable so Lith and I walked back to the other table and started chatting with the people around us. It was odd at first, I, I could hear myself matching the rough, low and unnatural voices everyone was using. Lith seemed to get into the flow of things faster than I did. I guess I was just being a little too judgmental at first, but soon I was talking normally to them without any odd accent, expressing my opinion as my character would. I think I started to get the hang of it when me and Lith were ushered into the new player training. Besides the two of us, there were eight teenagers and two other twenty-somethings. Among them I noticed something that clearly stood out. Among the women he had seen so far, all were borderline grotesque. <laughs> Even with layers of heavy makeup and robes, they still required a moment to get used to them after the initial shock of their appearance. <laughs> this one, however, was rather cute. She was standing away from the two clumps of teenagers and the other 20-year-olds, looking nervous and confused, which calmed me down for some reason. Eventually, an old man walked up to us. He must have been over 60, judging by his wrinkles and white hair. However, he was in surprisingly good shape, enough that made me wonder whether he was in better shape than Lith or me. With a calm yet commanding voice, he started to explain the rules of combat as we walked towards the cave. The cave is a cabin where the monsters would spawn from. Monsters were people who either volunteered and didn't have to pay the event fee, or were conscripted from the players for a few hours if there weren't enough. It was also the place they stored the monster costumes, a huge collection of foam, duct tape and PVC pipe weapons. Combat had very simple rules, avoid the head, try not to hurt anyone, and that you had to call out your damage each time you swung. When we finally reached the cave, he explained that we would now spend the rest of the night as monsters, as a bit of practice, and the next two days would play as heroes. Stepping inside the cave, I felt my blood boil with excitement. Apparently, all the athletic people spent their time as monsters. When we entered, there were two of them wailing at each other with foam weapons, hitting with enough force to make the old man tell them to stop, setting a bad example for us. Beyond them being athletic, they also almost universally had the same evil smirk on their face, which was noticeable enough for even Lith to whisper to me that he thought they all looked like sadists. When the two of them didn't stop, the old man stepped in between them and shouted an order for them to stop, at which point they went into another room. We then got outfitted as grunks, which the old man described as rat-like humanoids, wearing brown furry cloth and wielding foam daggers. The thirteen of us went out. The old man led us skillfully, sniffing the air at intersections and directing us with short barks and hand signs. In moments we were all grunks, searching for unprepared heroes ready to slaughter. The first group we met was a lone warrior. He was absolutely shocked to see us. The old man motioned for me and Lith to surround him, and the three of us stabbed at the warrior several times before he managed to run past the old man, right into the waiting daggers of the rest of the group. We continued on, all of us fairly pleased. We stumbled into Olsik. Olsik had an entourage of five people with him, which was still less than half of our number. Even so, I knew that we were all going to die, though when we died we would just lie down, wait until all the heroes left and then get back up thinking it's a good chance to at least take down one of these nobles. I was more than ready for the old man's order to rush in. I ran in, trying to get around the warrior with the shield protecting Olsik. Just as I broke past him, Olsik threw down a beanbag, shouting, Firestorm! 10 damage! Unsure what happened, I continued to move, until Olsik shouted, Every enemy within 50 foot radius of me takes 10 fire damage. With all of us having 5 HP, we simply laid down. I couldn't help but feel somewhat pissed, but the old man seemed rather happy about the outcome. He explained that a monster's job wasn't to kill players, but to be killed by them. And it was a good lesson about just how powerful one of the strongest people in the game was, especially compared to one of the weakest creatures. We got up and journeyed around for a few more hours. We mostly ended up getting killed from a distance, but occasionally we managed to get killed in melee. Though I could dodge and block fairly well, each dagger dealt only one damage, meaning even against a weak caster I'd need 10 hits before he dropped and it took one or two hits to take me down. I started to get foolishly frustrated, even though I knew I was just playing a really weak monster. 
It was a strange sense of futility I received from that experience, and I definitely didn't want to repeat it. Afterwards, we went back to the cave, put away the stuff, and then went to our assigned cabins. Once I arrived at Lith's and mine, I realised that Harjo was in a different cabin. Lith asked me why Harjo wasn't in ours, and I could only reply that it must be because he's part of a noble house. We then went to sleep, exhausted from having been rats for so long. When we got up, we looked for Harjo. We find him in the main cabin slash inn, talking to a noble. He told us that yesterday he was officially granted his title as a count, and now he could initiate us into Ulsic's noble house. Lith was very excited about this, while I guess I was less enthusiastic. Harjo said that we should go adventuring right after breakfast, which I guess I was very excited about. We went out, and I quickly realised I didn't serve much of a purpose. Harjo had been part of this LARP since it had started, and his character was several times stronger than either mine or Lith's. Lith would stand between a monster and Harjo, and Harjo would lob a spell he could cast at will that dealt 10 points of damage, often killing our enemy in two shots. We found three monsters after two hours of walking around, which apparently was a pretty high amount, especially during the morning hours. When lunch came around, Harjo said he had something he needed to do, so he left us in the inn. After talking to a few people, Lith and I decided to go out and adventure on our own. Leaving the inn, we set out on the same path we had taken with Harjo. We met our first monster, a troll. I hadn't really seen any of the monsters or get a chance to fight while Harjo had been with us. And though the three of us had taken out a troll earlier, I only had a vague idea of how strong it was. Of course, it dealing 8 damage with its foam club at least told us that it was much stronger than we were. The man who was playing the troll was skilled, but not cleverly so. His attacks just kept on getting caught by Lith's sword or shield, while I kept cutting at him with my two-handed sword, using its long reach to keep me at a safe distance. After 10 hits, he dropped, and we went on our way. Lith had taken a hit, but with 14 HP remaining, we decided to save my healing spell for a more dire need. Because I could stabilise a person brought to less than 0 HP so that they wouldn't die. On our route, we encountered one of the werewolf people. He was accompanied by a fat woman dressed like a warrior. And when we told them that we were just going around looking for adventure, they told us that they were actually looking for help. They wanted to go to a field where they had been told there was treasure, but they also knew that it was guarded by trolls. When we told them we had taken down a troll only minutes ago, the woman stopped and asked us what level we were. When I explained it was our first event, she couldn't believe it. Either way, the two of them decided to let us come with them. When we arrived at the field, there were three trolls, I assumed, standing beneath a tree, a small box between them. As soon as they saw us, two men moved out towards us, the last remaining behind. Lith and I moved towards one, while the wolf and the woman moved towards the other. This one was more skilled than the last and quickly scored a hit on Lith for 9 damage. With only 5 HP left, Lith was in a bad situation. As he moved back, I moved forward, attacking more carelessly, just trying to get as much damage in as possible. I pressed the troll back. Just when I thought I'd get in the last few hits in, I took 9 damage in the back. Moving quickly to the side, I turned to see both the wolf and woman lying on the ground. The troll they were fighting now attacking me. With the situation turning against us rapidly, I did some quick calculations. These were definitely stronger than the troll we had faced before, but hopefully not by much. If the first troll had about 40 plus HP, then the troll we had been fighting was probably a hit or two away from dying. Pulling out my bean bags, I began to throw them at him, calling out my weak fire spell. After four hits, he dropped, just as the other troll managed to land a strike on Lith, dropping him. Lith had done fairly well against it though and as I hit the troll with my strong fire spell, it dropped as well. I learned later that trolls take double damage from fire spells, which is probably the major reason we managed to take them down. I quickly healed up Lith back to 4 HP, one heal spell, but as I moved towards the werewolf and woman, the third troll started running towards us. As he neared, Lith shouted, What do I see? at him. Since the rags he was wearing could mean anything, he replied, A troll much bigger than the rest. With both of us being one head away from death, we had to make a hard decision. In a way, I ended up not having to make it. Lith ran first, and I immediately followed. Looking back, I saw the troll began chasing after us. Seeing how fast he ran, I suddenly realised something. Spinning around, I began running towards the troll, a bit slower than I'm fully capable of. He continued to run at me, 
until he came close enough to swing at me. He swung hard, but I just ran right past him, at which point he realised what I was after. Sprinting now as fast as I could, I reached the small chest and managed to pick it up just before he reached me. He swung again, but I managed to dodge and start running, sword in one hand, chest in the other. I managed to get out of the field and ran down the path, all the way to the inn, where Lith was trying to get a rescue crew together. I showed him the chest and opened it to find 30 gold, an absolute fortune, along with two magical rings. I was rather happy with myself, not realising just how much I was going to regret my actions later. Within the inn was a healer, and both Lith and I were healed back to our full HP. We then led the crew of six people to the field, where both the werewolf and the woman were gone, and the lone troll under a tree. The six surrounded the troll, but even then it was a hard fight as it probably had well over 200 HP, though I quickly lost count. Eventually it dropped, and when I asked where the werewolf slash woman was, I learned how death works in the game. After your HP goes below zero, you have five minutes where you can still be healed by a normal healing spell, like mine. After that five, you have ten minutes where you can be healed by an advanced healing spell. After that, you're dead, and need to be resurrected, which means you lose both money and experience. More than 15 minutes had passed for the wolf slash woman, which meant they simply stood up and walked back to the inn to get resurrected. I felt bad for those two, but it meant that both Lith and I would be the only ones to split the treasure. To explain how much a single piece of gold is, you typically might be able to get three pieces of gold in an event, if you work hard. Getting 15 split between me and Lith on the first day meant we could basically buy excellent gear for ourselves and still have some gold left over. Thinking about our good fortune, I didn't even suppose that I have any sort of problem immediately as I returned to the inn, especially not because the woman had, somehow, while she was unconscious, managed to see me run past the troll to get to the treasure chest, as opposed to come over to them and heal them, an ability I had only shown I was capable of after she had been knocked unconscious, and her being part of Ulsic's noble house didn't help matters. The woman had been telling her story in the inn while we were out trying to save her, and as we returned, she pointed me out as the guy who cared more about gold than people's lives. At first, the six who had come with us supported me, saying that I was new and I didn't know how death worked and that I still went back out to help her. This was quickly drowned out by her mentioning that I had not even bothered to offer any portion of the chest treasure. Things immediately turned even more sour. No one in the rescue party had even known about the treasure chest until they had heard her story and they suddenly became very interested in why they, the people who had managed to kill the troll, did not deserve the treasure. The woman who had died, realising that everyone was now caring more about the treasure than they did about her dying, began to harp even louder about just how terrible of a person I was. I quickly offered them each five gold pieces, thinking to keep the two rings for me and Lif, but they were more curious as to why I hadn't offered this to them before they had set out. I was in a very bad situation. If I explained that I had felt that I had earned the entire treasure and would have been completely content leaving that troll alive and the two corpses where they were, there was no way that would have gone over well. However, my silence as I tried to piece together what to say instead really didn't help my case. Especially because during that silence, Archduke Ulsic decided to make his appearance. Another person from his house told him what had happened and he listened calmly, silently making an odd head bobbing motion every once in a while. As the story finished, he walked over to me and told me to step outside with him. He's an easy man to dislike. He started out by telling me what exactly had happened, what everyone didn't know. The huge amount of treasure, an extraordinary amount, had been placed especially for the werewolf and woman to receive. They were actually waiting in the forest for two NPCs, who, unbeknownst to them, were going to use nothing but an infinite amount of heal spells and let them fight the trolls until they won. I stood listening to this, and I guess somewhat angrily asked what any of that had to do with me. He explained calmly, slowly, that I had snatched away something that I didn't deserve, and that I could potentially imbalance the game if I used that gold. I said that wasn't going to be a problem, because I had already promised to give the gold away to the six people who had come with us. He grew furious. He asked me if I knew what I had done, how I had taken the gold and now made it so that it could no longer be easily returned without upsetting all those players, how this would cheapen the entire gold economy, and how I had single-handedly devalued every magical item in the game. 
I said he must be exaggerating, and he said that there was no way I could understand. Mate, if if you don't want that much gold in the game, if it's going to fucking don't have that much gold, don't fucking put the gold in then. Hyperinflation. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Fuck me. (laughs) Jesus Christ. He then stood silent, apparently thinking hard, until he gave me the absolute worst smile I've ever seen in my entire life. He told me that he had a solution. Being an absolute idiot, I smiled back thinking that the man would just magically smooth away the problem. As he went inside, he said that I was being convicted of murder, that through my negligence, I had let two people unjustly die, and that for my crime, I would be executed through decapitation. Absolute silence followed. So he continued. He said that leaving a noble of his house to die was the same as leaving him to die. I would be an example to all, so that anyone he claims to be a hero will never make the same mistake of being overcome by greed. And as a lesson to y'all, the state would seize all of my assets. I looked out at the crowd, waiting for a reaction. Waiting for someone to scream, FUCKING BULLSHIT! Or, HE'S A BRAND NEW PLAYER! Or, YOU'VE GONE MAD WITH POWER! Instead, the first one to say something was that fat, disgusting woman who I'm glad I had inadvertently killed and only wished she would stay dead. He shouted, Long live the Archduke! Ugh. Ugh. Cringe. The crowd slowly erupted in a chant, and to my horror, I realised that Harjo was among them. I looked for Lith's face in the crowd, and was equally dismayed to see a look of absolute indifference. One that said, It's just a game, this might actually be fun. I could only shoot him a pleading glance, followed by an angry one at Harjil. He actually paused, but one look from the Archduke was more than enough to get him going again. The Archduke, with a look of utter triumph, simply picked up the chest and walked away, leaving me to the other nobles. I was then led to the jail, an unused closet with barely enough room for me to stand. I was told that I was supposed to wait in there until my execution, the time of which would be decided by the Archduke. Then they closed the door, leaving me in the cramped darkness. I waited in the darkness of the small closet, collecting my thoughts, trying to come to terms with what was happening. In a way, I was actually fortunate to have a little time out, as it gave me time to think and question. I began to question what my next line of action was. My first option, and the most obvious one, was to just accept the sentence. Being executed meant that I would be permanently killed in a way that prevented resurrection. I was a first level character, and starting up a new character wouldn't really change much. More importantly, it was the only choice that was presented to me, as neither negotiating for a fair trial nor escaping really seemed like options. But every fibre of who I was did not want to be executed, even if it was just for pretend in a pretend world. Even if the circumstances around it were all make-believe, my innocence was real. Every ounce of rebellious spirit that I had in me said to find some way out of this mess. To oppose the tyrannical decision of Ulsic and the apathy of the populace that enabled it. Even though I had found my resolve, I still could not find any way to remedy my situation. Harjil and Leth came to visit me, leading me out of the cramped closet. They tried to convince me that all I really could do was accept the execution and try to make it a fun role-playing experience. I told them that they could have a fun role-playing experience in helping me escape with a rather downcast look. Hargill explained that there was no way he could oppose Ulsic, especially because it was because of him that he had finally become a noble. Not to mention that Ulsic was possibly the strongest person in the game. Lith simply said that it would be easier for me just to make a new character, rather than try to iron out all the problems this one had. He even said I could make him identical to Nephim, except I'd had to change his name. We argued a bit more until it became clear that they wouldn't help me willingly. I then asked them why they had even bothered to come see me, if all they were going to do was tell me my only choice was death. At this point, Hargill actually became somewhat angry, telling me that it had not been easy for him to come see me, and that he actually had to use his rank as a noble to get this chance. I responded with the question of whether he had actually bothered to take me out of my cramped cell. Looking at the closet I was no longer in, Hargill, calming down slightly, said that it was obvious he had not, realising my intention. I bolted. I was almost out the door before either of them realised what I was doing. They began to shout, but by the time someone took notice, I was a good, safe distance. A low-level mage tried to throw spells at me, 
but his throws were short and a moment later I disappeared into the woods, running far and deep into the middle of the camping grounds. I found a small ring of dense bushes in a wooded spot that was well away from the main roads. Moving into the centre of them, I feel rather secure about not being spotted within them. I sat down and began to think of what to do next. Before I decided anything else, I realised I needed to get myself prepared. In order to be a fugitive, I needed to get three major things. Food, a place to sleep, and perhaps the most important, a weapon. Once I had those three, I could decide on what to do next. Food and a place to sleep were a problem. Meals were purchased at the inn, which was also the place where I was sure to find plenty of people who could kill me with a glance. Beyond that, I had brought a fair amount of snacks with me. Probably enough so that I wouldn't have to buy any food for the weekend. However, all these snacks were in my bags, which were in my cabin. That was also the place I was expected to sleep, which meant it was the place I was expected to go. Which meant it was the place I expected they would try to catch me. If I was even to try going there, I wanted to at least be armed with more than just a few bean bags. My character could only use a two-handed sword. Other mages typically could use a dagger and small swords. But I had taken those points and added them just so I could use a two-handed sword. My choice was made under the assumption that I'd never need or want to use a smaller sword. But now I was in a really bad situation. In order for me to get a new weapon, I had three options. Stealing an unattended one that a person owned meant that I had to get a specially sanctioned witness, which I knew was a stupid idea. I could always just break the rules, but that was grounds for being kicked out of the game itself. If I was going to do this, I was going to do this without anyone being able to condemn me for opposing the spirit of the game. If I broke a rule, nothing I did would matter, since they would just retcon everything. I had to beat them at their own game with their own rules. That left either taking one from a fallen person, or I could just grab one from the pals at the cave. Neither of these options seemed very practical. There were very few players who used two-handed swords, and beyond just finding them, I'd have to defeat them unarmed. Going to the cave seemed smarter, since players avoid going near it and there was undoubtedly weapons there. But I also had an enormous chance of running into a monster, who'd be more likely to be able to outrun me considering the monsters I had seen were more athletic than the players. While I considered my options, I heard voices coming close. I knew that I was fairly safe within these bushes, invisible unless they decided to force their way through them. But I was still extremely nervous, holding my breath with the amateur thought that it would keep them from hearing me. As I listened, I realised that there were three teenagers, one who I remembered quite clearly because of his awkward, cracking voice that was an absolute challenge to respond to with a mindset that he was playing a gruff and strong warrior, peering out of the bushes as they passed some distance away. I was very glad I had chosen neutral greys for my outfit rather than the flashy colours that seemed to be in fashion here. The three of them, all warriors, though none with two-handed swords, wore bright colours that encouraged me to think of them as targets. Without a plan formed, I slowly slid out of the bushes, then casually, silently, moved after them. While I was still a good distance away, I threw my ice spell at the closest one, calling out the spell's name in the most intimidating voice I could. Hitting him squirrely in the back, he froze in good faith of role-playing, while the other two wheeled nervously around. I hit the second before he had a chance to move, and the third kept close to his friends while I brandished another beanbag. Counting down the 30 seconds in my head, I had very little time before the three of them tried to rush me. While my aim was solid, I doubted that I could hit them all without the element of surprise, especially since I only managed to hit two while I had it. I asked them first what they were doing, and with a strange, obliging obedience, the lone mobile one answered curtly. Apparently, I had a 30 gold bounty on my head. This was an obscene amount of money just for catching such a weak fugitive, and I didn't blame them for trying to hunt me. I, however, was not just going to lie down and let them take it without a challenge. With the 30 seconds almost up, I knew that I had to run. Looking back in the opposite direction from them, I realised my cabin was in that direction. With a burst of inspiration, I ran directly at them. The three teens panicked, with no real reason considering I didn't even have a weapon. But I kept well out of three swords ranges, running around them in the direction opposite my cabin. I made an emphasis on my speed, running with the intent that no sane person would try to keep up with me until I was a good distance away from the encounter. Seeing that I had no brochures, I stopped to catch my breath, 
Wondering whether I could keep up such a pace all day, I continued on a little further in that direction before I looked around, with the guess that the three were heading towards the inn, telling everyone where they had spotted me and where they thought I was going. If I had any chance at getting my stuff from the cabin, this was it. The campgrounds were pretty large, and it could easily take more than an hour to walk from one end to the other. With a floating map fuzzily drawn in my mind, I tried to predict where people would be and where they would be heading. Thankfully, for the extensive travelling I had done on the grounds as a grunt, this may sound like a pretty impressive ability, but it was mostly trying to figure out how to avoid the main roads while taking the smaller paths. I did fairly well for myself, using a few paths that were practically hidden that I would never have known if I had not been shown by the old man who had led us. I managed to get close to my cabin with only hearing people in the distance. However, just as I neared it, voices surprised me from just beyond a bend in the path I was taking. I dove into the woods, glad that the road was somewhat elevated and that I had basically dropped into a ditch. A large grip appeared from beyond the bend and I nervously knew that I had no chance of staying undiscovered if they continued down the path. Thankfully, they took an earlier fork and moved away on a different, larger path but I managed to catch snippets of their conversation. My guess had been correct and that they had been waiting for me at my cabin. And while they agreed that 30 gold was way too much for just capturing me, they however were not complaining. As soon as they had gone a good distance, I moved out of the ditch, dusting myself off. I didn't waste any more time and rushed into my cabin. With haste, I gathered my snacks together into my small sleeping bag, darning a candy bar and a bag of chips in the process. While it wasn't the most nutritious meal, it at least satisfied me. What was the greater satisfaction was that I had managed to outwit everyone into thinking I was elsewhere. Everyone except Lith. Lith stood at the entrance, blocking it. His sword and shield were readied, and the look on his face said that this wasn't going to end well. Even so, I greeted him, telling him I planned on being a fugitive, and that I could use all the help I could get. He responded simply, telling me that Harjo was no longer a noble, that he had been demoted because he had let me escape and that now there were very little chance that Cerberus would become a noble house. I told Death that it wasn't my fault and it was Hargel's fault, that all of this was because of Ulsic. I even wanted to tell him about Ulsic's whole plan with the original treasure, but I realised that wouldn't sway him an inch. He just looked at me, knowing that I was unarmed, and calmly said that I should have just made a new character. I replied, slowly, knowing that I would regret the scene that followed. I said that I was just doing what my character would do, that all I was doing was role playing, the thing we came here to do. Lith agreed. He said that was what we came here to do, and that what he was going to do now was just what his character would do, that all he was going to do was role play. He lunged forward. Hargel and Lith had both been giving me advice while I made my character, and both of them knew I had built him wrong. Compared to a pure warrior, I had lower stats across the board. Compared to a pure spellcaster, I had only a fraction of their spells and the amount of times they could cast them. Worse still, I decided not to specialise in a single skill of magic, which meant that I had only the weakest of all three skills, except for the seven damage fire spell, which is the second weakest of the fire skill. In the end, my character could not be a mage because he could not rely on his spells, and he was far weaker than any other fighter. However, in this exact situation, to both Lith and my regret, I was invincible. As he lunged forward, I hit him with my ice spell. He was still blocking the lone exit, so he began to count to 30 aloud, trying to show me how futile that spell was. I then hit him with my one damage fire spell. I then hit him again. It then dawned on him what my plan was. Combining the skills of fire and ice, I had no chance of losing. He had no ranged attacks, no defences, nothing he could do. As the 30 seconds expired, I hit him with another ice spell, and then continued. His 22 HP dwindled away rapidly, until he was left with a single hit point. I renewed the ice spell, and then told him that he should run to the inn and get healed. He was furious at first, but he seemed to realise just how terrible it would be for me to be the one who killed his character. As he nodded in agreement, I put down my hand, glad that this had not turned out worse. As the ice spell expired, he lunged forward at me. He would have hit me. He had actually surprised me shocked me to the point where there was no way I could have consciously reacted. Had I not been casting the same fire spell over and over again for the last five minutes, I probably would have been captured right there. 
unable to defend myself against him after he had closed the gap between us. But the spell had been drilled into my mind, and I reflexively acted, tossing the bing bag at him before he came within reach. As he dropped to the ground, defiantly silent, I panicked. I needed to get a healer to him quickly, but there was no way for a fugitive to do so. Were I to go to the inn, I would simply be captured or killed, and even then there was little chance a healer would reach Lith in time. Finding one by chance on the road was a long shot as well, and I was very much more likely to run into a group of bounty hunters or monsters. With a glance at my watch, I saw that he had very little time before his first five minutes were up, meaning that he would require advanced healing, not just basic healing like the spell I had. After realising how stupid I was, I found myself debating whether I should use one of my two remaining heal spells on a person I myself damaged. I knew that I was going to need them later if I was expecting to survive as a fugitive, and there'd be no other way I could get healing. Knowing Lith would never forgive me if I was the one that killed him, it became a very easy choice. I kicked aside his sword and shield, well out of his reach. Grabbing my sleeping bag, I knelt down to him, apologising that things had to turn out like this. As soon as I healed him, before he could get up, I hit him with a nice spell. I then ran out of the cabin, food and sleeping gear triumphantly in tow. I wondered if it had been worth it. By now, it was late afternoon. With food obtained, I decided I'd do the next easiest thing, which was to find a place to sleep and to leave my stuff. That may be one of the better things about LARPing, I think. When playing a tabletop role-playing game, carrying gear and sleeping meant absolutely nothing, to the point where I wouldn't even keep track of it. At LARP, you learn to appreciate being able to ignore those things. Here, I would have a hard time escaping any pursuers if I had to carry a sleeping bag filled with food while doing so. And while sleeping in the woods with my sleeping bag was a possibility, I wasn't going to do it if I didn't have to. Besides, there were cabins scattered about the campgrounds. There were other small buildings and sites, like picnic grounds with tables, that might be easier to sleep at. My first choice would be to find a cabin that had been left unassigned. But this was also most risky. It would be a really bad scene to think a cabin was unoccupied and then find out it wasn't. Even so, the existing prospect of sleeping in an equipment shed or outhouse wasn't enough to dissuade me from taking that risk. Travelling far away from the inn to the cabins I assumed they would assign last, I found myself encountering less and less people and having to hide less and less often. The people who were pursuing me, who I assume was everyone considering the size of the bounty, really didn't seem keen on doing a good job looking for me. They were just patrolling around the main roads, not bothering to poke around in the smaller ones, let alone the woods. With the whole campgrounds to look over, I realised that within the outskirt reaches, I could basically move around without really having to fear being found. I stalked several cabins, watching them from a distance. When it seemed like no one was around, I'd run up, check to see if there was any signs of people staying there. And if I saw bags lying around, I'd go to the next cabin. Finally, just as it was dark, I found a cabin that was well detached from all the others. Peering inside, I saw that there was no sign anyone had been there. As I tried the front door and found it locked, I began to wonder if what I was about to do was going to be considered unlawful entry. I tried one of the windows, which were almost rustic with their simplicity, and opened it without difficulty. Inside, it was fairly bare beyond wooden bed frames with plastic wrapped mattresses, but there was a small kitchen and a bathroom. After relieving myself and getting a nice drink of the tap water, I located a closet. Inside, it was not very large, but there was enough room for me to sleep in if I slept in a fetal position. While sleeping on a mattress would be infinitely more comfortable. I wasn't going to be taking any more chances than I already was, but now was not the time to even consider sleeping. So I just downed a few more snacks, put my gear in the closet and left through the window. It was getting fairly dark, which was to my advantage. I've always had good night vision, meaning the poor light would only serve to hide me from my enemies. While I never prided myself on being stealthy, I guess that might have been because I've never had the chance to test myself. Even now though, I still wouldn't consider it to be one of my skills. Considering that the people I was sneaking around were often obviously not looking for anyone, it seemed that most people had given up on actively searching for me, which made my life all the easier. However, it didn't solve my major problem. I had decided to take a weapon from the cave. Moving towards it, I determined my earlier fears had not been misguided. Were it not for the darkness, I probably would have been quickly discovered and attacked by the monsters that wandered about near it. They were constantly actively searching for people, not just for me, as it was common for weak players to hide from the monsters at night. 
I pressed my luck and was rewarded as I reached the cave without being found. Stepping inside the large cabin, I was relieved to find the main room empty and the large piles of weapons exactly as I remembered them. Perhaps taking my time more than I should have, I looked through all the two-handed swords until I found one I considered to be the best. It was the maximum length for a two-hander, but was light and simple, without any senseless decoration beyond a thin foam crossguard. Though I knew my major tactics of running and hiding would remain unchanged, I at least felt like I now had the opportunity to fight. Just as I was leaving, the old man appeared from one of the back rooms. My first instinct was to run, but I just slowly turned around and left. As normally as if I was just any old monster ready to set out in patrol. A moment passed before he called out to me, but by then I was already sprinting towards the safety of the dark woods, sword in hand. Now it was time to plan. The entire time I had been gathering and preparing, I had been thinking of what exactly it was that I wanted to do. There was no point in trying to clear my name and just surviving until I was caught wasn't really much of a plan. Thinking of what Nemphim, my character, would do in this situation, I realised I didn't really have the choice to get out of this land. Especially if you took the real world consideration that Hargel had been the one to drive us here. I then simply asked what it was that I really wanted to do. I really wanted to kill that fat woman warrior. Archduke Ulsic also really deserved to die. In fact, I wanted to see just about every player he had sided with Ulsic and hunting me suffer a bit. But I was more than willing to just watch the noble house of Ulsic crumble. Fantasising about seeing everyone have their precious characters killed. I quickly realised the difficulty, if not impossibility, of me being able to accomplish something like that. Setting my sights low, I decided it would be best just to focus on having the woman warrior get killed, while antagonising the Ulsic house whenever I could. This didn't leave me with much of a time frame. It was already Saturday night, the event only lasted until Sunday afternoon, giving me only a few hours to do anything. Every second now had the utmost importance especially because I planned on never coming back here again. With such a small amount of time to work with, I needed every edge I could get. While just having the sword with me felt comforting, the tiny bit of damage I dealt with it didn't really seem like it would let me accomplish my goal within the time allotted. Though I was certain I could kill the woman in solo combat, I doubt there was ever a time where she'd be alone without some manner or backup. Combined with my spells, I might have a chance against two people, though not if one were a mage. Magic in this game was definitely overpowered, and I think I could understand why. Almost every top tier noble was a wizard, including Ulsic himself. All the most important battles would be fought between mages, and the warriors only really served the purpose of standing between the wizards, creating a nice wall for them to cast over. What scared me the most about the mages was abilities like Ulsic's Firestorm. While dodging beanbags wasn't easy, you still had the chance. With undodgeable area attacks, the only hope you had was that your character was strong enough to survive. Thankfully, mages typically dressed like poisoned dart frogs, making it easy to not only see that they were dangerous, but easy to see from a distance. In order to kill the woman warrior, I'd have to attack her at a time when I could tell there wasn't a mage within running distance, which I doubted would be an easy task. Wondering if there was anything I was overlooking on my character sheet, I fished into my pockets to retrieve it. As I did, my fingers brushed against two things I had completely forgotten about. I had removed the two magical rings from the treasure box and never returned them. This was undoubtedly a cause to celebrate. While made out of cheap plastic and set with cheap plastic gems, the real worth of the ring could be determined by a chart that revealed what each type of ring did. Unable to remember the whole chart, or even more than a small part of it, I was at least able to determine that the gold and blue gem ring was undoubtedly powerful but also that the silver and three red gemmed ring was most likely unique. Unique rings were ones that were not on the chart, at least not on the chart in the rulebook, meaning that in order to find out what it did, I'd have to ask a plot master. My joy quickly fading, I realised that without knowing what they did, these rings were just cheap pieces of plastic. Even so, I was still glad I kept them. Slipping them back in my pocket, I began to review my character sheet only to realise that it was far too dark to make out a single word. Taking a bit of a risk, I moved towards one of the major paths, which had large streetlights placed sparing me upon them. Reading my statistics beneath the light, I found nothing I didn't already know. Even so, it was good to actually see what I could do, and I began to formulate what kind of strategies I had available to me. In a somewhat ironic sense, while I mused over how to be tactful and strategic, I was standing out in the open beneath the streetlight, 
This may have been a bad place because I was clearly visible and vulnerable, but it was even worse because my eyes were adjusting to the light. As the two monsters approached me, I didn't even notice them until it was far too late. They saw me and didn't even hasten their pace. I called out to them, asking what I saw. One replied that they were murder grunks, and seeing my confusion, the other simply explained that they were stronger grunks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that's <laughs> As they walked towards me, their short swords ready, I felt a strange calmness. It felt like a proper gentlemanly duel, rather than an ambush. I felt like we were all on the same wavelength, understanding that what we were about to do was a battle that would test our physical skills and ability, rather than what our stats dictated. It was to be an honourable, feel-good battle, where no matter who was slain, we'd all congratulate each other on an excellent fight. Just as they leapt to attack me, three more of them leapt out of the woods. <laughs> <laughs> Cursing, I quickly struck one twice, relying more on the reach of my sword than my actual skill. He fell, making me take the guess that even though they were stronger than ordinary grunks, they were not stronger by much. The other four stopped advancing and spread out to surround me. Were the circumstances different, my principle would be to shout and delay them until help arrived, with that being a more deadly option than trying to face these four. I decided on a plan that may have been even more foolish. Calling out to one, I challenged him. A direct, clear challenge. The other three seemed indifferent, ready to just swarm and kill me. But I had chosen the right one. This guy was tall and fairly muscular, very unlike the rat-like creature he was supposed to be. With a few short words, he told the other three he could take me. And with a bit of reluctance, they moved away from the two of us. He leapt at me, in a way that you were not allowed to do at this lark. Within the rules, combat was expected to be two people standing a few feet away from each other, tapping their weapons at each other until the person who dealt more damage or had more HP won. Jumping at your opponent was not allowed, as it was considered dangerous, and getting too close to a person was likewise prohibited. In that moment, and probably every moment like it, I simply didn't care and was glad that someone was willing to actually give me a fight. He had charged in close, but too short for the reach of his sword. Yet within the reach of mine, I slashed at him, forcing him to block and tried a second slash before he leapt back. He was skilled, perhaps even more than I was, but both my weapon and my statistics were superior. As he tried to figure out how he could actually strike me with his short sword, I interrupted his thoughts by rushing in at him. He was far too good with the short sword, blocking every strike I tried, but the difference in reach kept him from returning any attacks. Finally, I bent down low, striking his legs, it was a solid hit, too low for him to block with his sword, and I quickly followed it with another, felling him. The other three had remained silent spectators, but as they saw their comrade fall, they began to make odd rat-like noises. Me. <laughs> <laughs> I turned to face them, ready for them to swarm me. Instead, another one took a step forward, and with a bit of relief, I challenged him as well. This fight was short. As I likewise discovered he was a skilled fighter and that he could block my attacks with leisure. But two strikes to the legs was enough to defeat him. The third didn't even wait for me to properly challenge him. And I didn't even wait to find out if he was good at blocking. I kept attacking his feet, forcing him to leap back each time, unable to find a counter. As he reached the edge of the path and his foot fell into a small ditch that was beyond it, I struck him squarely on the shoulder and followed it with a hit on the other side. The last one approached me with a low stance, and I first thought he was just acting like the rat creature he was supposed to be. It didn't take me long to realise he had figured out the counter to my low attacks, and from his low stance his short sword guarded his legs with ease. I was also pressed with a different difficulty, in that the one target that I had access to was also the one I wasn't allowed to hit. He didn't even bother to guard his head, in a strange form of faith, and I was left trying to slash his sides only to have my efforts wasted by his blocks. While his stance was good for defence, he had no real way to attack me. His crouch kept him from being very mobile, and we fought in almost the same position for far too long a length of time. Seeing that he wasn't even breathing hard, I suddenly felt all the exhaustion the last battles owed me. Gasping for breath, I continued to attack, knowing that each passing moment was just to his advantage. The second I'd stop my attack, he'd rush in, dealing damage that I could not risk to take. With a final, wild swing, I gave up. Too tired and too unskilled, I realised I had no chance of beating him in this manner of fighting. As soon as he saw the opportunity, he leapt forward, 
his sword flashing out at my shoulder for two points of damage. I responded in kind, however, for four points. With no skill, no effort, nothing but raw statistics, I took his next hit and returned it with my own. There was a mutual feeling of disappointment, but I could not just let myself be killed by a bunch of random rat people. As he dropped, I asked if I found any treasure on them. They handed me five copper pieces, a fair amount of money, and then left them as they went to respawn somewhere else. The two eights I had taken were bad, but I still had 10 HP left. A bit low for a warrior to have, but I was quickly realising that I might just not have what it takes to be a melee fighter. Knowing that I had to rapidly learn the style of fighting that took place here, or I didn't have a chance at accomplishing my goals, I began to wonder if it was the time to start seeking fights. I didn't have to, as it was all too easy for fights to find me. Like most nights, that night had a special thing. Every monster that was out there was either a grunk or a murder grunk, and they were out in full force. The side roads were now just as deadly, if not more so, than the main roads, something that took me a few encounters to determine. Fighting against the people who played the monsters was a rare treat for me, and after taking down six two-man grips, I realised I was overextending myself in order to keep fighting them. Keeping to the small roads, I kept fighting and fighting, ambushing one grip or being ambushed by another. I went out of my way to pick fights, enraptured by what probably was some form of bloodlust. With each enemy carrying a single copper piece, I had a good way to keep track of how many I had been fighting, as I would have lost count otherwise. I at first pitied my enemies for having low HP and dealing only one or two points of damage. I quickly got over that, as my own HP dwindled and I saw that they basically all had infinite lives. I would fight a grip only to fight them again within the next few minutes, knowing full well that I would see them again soon. The battle slowly became easier as I began to recognise people and how they fought, and the monsters seemed to slowly get used to the nature of having infinite respawns. As the night continued, they grew less and less defensive, more willing to do suicidal rushes and risky manoeuvres, knowing full well that they would return in a matter of minutes. As time flew by, I began to wonder what exactly I was doing. With only 6 HP left, I collected over 50 copper coins, half of a gold piece, but not having accomplished much else. With the large amount jingling in my pocket, I eventually asked a lone murder grunk I had ambushed and slung. If he had any silver pieces that I could exchange for my copper, he asked me how many rat people I had defeated by then, and I started counting. Amazed, the murder grunk introduced himself, and then told me that when he wasn't playing a monster, he'd play a character named Vlain. Vlain explained that the cave right now was basically empty, with every monster running about. They were actually supposed to be assaulting the inn, where all the players were gathered together. However, I had chosen a fairly inconvenient hunting ground for the monsters, as I was right between the inn and the cave, with only a handful ever actually reaching the inn and being killed almost instantly by the high-powered people that guarded it. Most of the rat people were actually preferring to find and fight me than to journey all the way to the inn. Realising that I was ruining what was most likely Ulsic's planned event, I couldn't help but feel proud. Thanking Vlain for the information and for exchanging my copper for some silver coins, I made my way back to the small paths, reinvigorated thanks to having found a purpose. The rat folk changed their tactics. Rather than moving in two people grips, they moved around individually, searching for me. While they could have easily defeated me by just moving around in groups of four or more, I think I came to realise that their goal wasn't a collaborative one. Each monster wanted to be the lone one who managed to kill me. This made my life much easier, as ambushing them became almost too easy and the subsequent battles were over in seconds. The encounters were now placed closer together, but I grew less tired as the night continued, having found a style of attack that worked almost too well. The legs were my favourite targets. The only way they could be defeated was from the crouched position or by moving backwards. What this meant was that any time they wanted to move forward, their legs became perfect targets. I would wait for my opponent to take that step forward to attack with a short dagger or sword, and with a step back of my own, I would strike his exposed leg, with my fading strike, working every single time, no matter how often I used it against the same person. I thought about just how frustrated all the monsters must be. They continued to keep to the small paths I was on, a nearly continuous assault of battles. As soon as I dropped one grunk, I would spot another who had heard the sounds of battle, and I would rush to meet him. With adrenaline surging through me, I continued to fight, slowly learning how to use my sword until I felt like I really could match the monsters in actual skill. 
not simply cheap tactics and an abuse of my reach advantage. After exchanging coins a few times with Lane, he told me that the monsters were glad I did so, as they would probably have run out of copper coins. In the five hours I had spent fighting, I had managed to collect two gold coins and three silver ones, an impressive haul by any standard. But the five hours had taken their toll, with no healing spells left and only three HP. I could barely move. Thankfully, it seemed that the monsters were too exhausted and their numbers slowly dwindled until finally I was certain that I was all alone in these woods. Trudging back to the cabin I commandeered as my own, I opened the door, too exhausted to think. The inside was very dark, far darker than the moonlit night outside, but I didn't want to risk turning on the light. I moved towards the closet that would be my personal sanctuary, ready to pass out. The lights suddenly flashed on and I wheeled around, adrenaline knocking aside any fatigue. Standing by the light switch was the young nervous girl I had met many hours before. Startled and surprised by someone she was clearly not expecting, she must have been either sleeping or waiting in bed as she was dressed in simple pyjamas. With the rules of the game dictating that we were both still active players, I looked at her as a threat. She had no weapon on her, but if she were a pure mage, that meant nothing. With only 3 HP, a single spell would be more than enough to take me out. Not wanting to take that chance, I moved towards her, sword ready. She surrendered, throwing both hands out wide, showing that she didn't even have a beanbag to throw. She then told me that she didn't even have any spells remaining, as she had used them up already. Perhaps somewhat foolishly, I trusted her, telling her to go back to bed. I quickly turned out the lights and locked the door, only realising now how stupid I was for not noticing it had been unlocked earlier. She knew who I was. At least, she knew how I was a fugitive murderer with 30 gold bounty on his head. I told her that all I wanted to do was sleep, and that the closet was the only safe place I could find. I asked if I could trust her not to tell anyone, so that I wouldn't have to kill her. When I said it like that, she told me that there was no doubt that I could trust her. Slumping down into the closet, I waited for my heartbeat to slow. The last bit of excitement having roused it into a rapid tempo. Feeling hungry, I offered her a bag of chips, as I opened one for myself. As we ate, she asked me what I had been doing for the last day, and I felt the strange need to tell someone what I had gone through. As soon as I finished, I asked her what she had been doing, and if she had any news that could help me. Her character's name was Selena, and she had come here with her boyfriend. Her boyfriend, much like Harchel, had been here since the very beginning, and was one of the most powerful warriors. He had convinced her to come, though she admitted that she was very reluctant. He had built her character for her, telling her that he had planned on working with her as a team. She was a mage, but could not use any weapon and only had 7 HP. All of her points had been spent in healing spells. He had made her into a pocket mage. <laughs> <laughs> That's bad hack, I do. That's what you know. It's like, me. No. You, you can't just drag someone along to a fucking That she doesn't want to go to and make her a fucking pocket mage. <laughs> That's just sad, to be honest with you. That's really sad. I'd make you a pocket mage. I'd like to see you try. <laughs> These two words may not mean much to non-LARPers, because it may be something that can only exist at a LARP. While a warrior may be powerful, there was a way that they could be practically invincible. While they fought, they could have a mage with a hand on their back, constantly healing them. This two-person combo was so effective. It ended up being a sole tactic used by the most powerful players at the last LARP I had gone to. Fighting against a warrior who had a pocket mage was at best like chopping at a tree trying to get the mage to expend all their spells so you actually had a chance to damage the warrior themselves. She had followed her boyfriend around all day, healing him and others when necessary, until it came to the big battle that had taken place at the inn. He had underestimated the grunk swarm, running into the centre of one, and ended up having Selena use all her healing spells. Without her spells, she was effectively useless, and opted to go to her cabin. Her boyfriend also wanted to leave with her, but Ulsic kept saying that more and more rat folk were on their way, since he had to help defend the inn from a massive swarm that would never actually reach it. The boyfriend had stayed behind, reaching into my pocket to take out a piece of gold so that I could give her something in exchange for her silence besides a threat. I realised I still had the two rings. I quickly asked her if there was a rule book inside this cabin, and she went over to her boyfriend's bags and pulled out a copy. Reading with a flashlight, I found the page with the ring chart, was impressed by what I had, the gold ring with a blue gem was a ring of minor spell reflection. What this meant was that I could block spells with my sword. Ordinarily, one of the reasons why mages were so powerful was because both the shield and the weapon of a warrior 
were viable targets for their spells, forcing them to dodge if they wanted to avoid the spell. With the sword and shield being the most popular weapon combo, this shield served mostly as a giant target for the spellcasters. However, with either sword, shield, or a ring of minor spell reflection, neither the sword nor shield counted as targets, meaning you could block spells that came towards you. A major ring of spell reflection actually lets you bounce back any spells you blocked right back at its caster three times a day, but the minor ring was still much more powerful than someone like me deserved. I also determined that the ring with the three red gems was in fact a unique one, which was at least better than being unsure about it. Placing both my rings on my fingers, I thanked Selena, gave her the gold piece, and explained that I was using it to buy her silence, and then dug into my small closet nest. An hour later, her boyfriend marched inside, waking me from my light sleep. He seemed rather angry, and I quickly learned why. He and the rest of the nobles had been staying at the inn, waiting for an ambush they were expecting to come, but only a handful of rat folk ever made their way to the inn after the first initial wave. Ulsic eventually ended up breaking character, calling the cave, finding out that all the monsters were too tired to go and attack the inn. All the players who had stayed up all night at the inn were furious. Having been denied what was supposed to be a fun and easy battle, Selina explained that it had been me that had been fighting hundreds of rat folk, and he quickly demanded to know how she knew. She explained that one of the monsters she was going back to the cabin had told her what had happened, and her boyfriend ranted and raved for a little while longer before he collapsed into his bed. I returned to sleep, but with the urgency that comes from understanding I only had the rest of the day to complete my goals, I woke up after only another three hours of sleep. If my guesses were correct, most of the players would still be sleeping at this time, especially since they had practically spent the entire night guarding the inn. After eating a pathetic breakfast, I looked out of the closet into the cabin. Selena and her boyfriend were sleeping in what I noticed were separate beds. Ooh. <laughs> Looking at the gear her boyfriend had carelessly tossed to the ground, including a clearly magical two-handed sword, I wished vehemently that you didn't need a sanctioned witness in order to steal things. Just as I was about to leave the cabin, a dirty little roll suddenly entered my mind. With the rule book within reach, I went ahead and made sure I had read it correctly. I read it again to make sure that I had not omitted anything. I then struggled slightly with my decision. Available to all players was the ability to deliver a finishing blow to a fallen enemy. Dropping a monster or player to zero HP meant that I had only fallen unconscious and that I would still take the 15 minutes for it to die. However, by delivering a coup de grace, a declared attack that you had to wait 5 seconds before you delivered it, you bypassed the whole 15 minutes and just instantly killed your opponent. And the rules made certain to say that this finishing blow could be used on sleeping people, making it possibly the best way to assassinate someone. I wondered at first if I was betraying Selena's trust by murdering her boyfriend while he slept, but knowing that he was from House Ulsic made my decision very simple. With a sword in hand, I declared my attack, counted the five seconds out loud, and gently tapped his shoulder. I then gently woke him. He did not awaken gently. He knew full well what I had done before I even told him. He threw a fit, loud enough to wake Selena, but I calmly showed him the rules I had followed, and told him that he had died in his sleep, not even knowing he had killed him. He had no choice but to accept his character's death, but I knew for certain that when he went back to the inn to get resurrected, He'd tell everyone that I killed him. I then almost ran right out of the cabin, before realising something very important. I turned to the guy and told him I was taking his stuff. With him being a fallen enemy, he would act as a witness, and I looted his gear. He turned to Selena, and he knew better than I did that she had no way of stopping me. Emptying a pouch that held over 50 gold, what? and grabbing the two-handed sword, I felt somewhat reluctant about parting with my old sword. I asked him if he wanted to keep the physical weapon and overly ornate the tacky piece and he agreed that he'd prefer if I just took the two ribbons that told people that his sword was both plus three and made of enchanted silver. Hoping my tiny bit of revenge against the noble house would not backfire on me, I ran off. Keeping to the smaller paths, I briefly considered going into other cabins and killing other people while they slept. This plan dissolved rather quickly as within the half hour I managed to find two people talking at a crossroad. Moving off the path, I listened and discovered that the boyfriend had not even waited to tell people at the inn, but had warned a fellow noble, who was now rousing everyone awake. At first I felt bad that potential victims were now gone, but I realised this was better for me. They'd be weakened by lack of sleep, and more importantly, they'd be active, giving me something to do. 
The two people then parted and ran off in opposite directions, leaving me to figure out a plan. Attaching the two ribbons to my sword, I could now deal seven damage, and double damage against creatures weak to silver. Since it was a brand new day, I had my full 14 HP, along with my 1 7 damage fire spell and my 3 4 HP heal spell. I felt ready to take on the world. While feeling pretty good about my new find and restored power, I spotted Vlain heading towards the cave. Seeing that he wasn't a monster just yet, I went up to him and asked him what he was doing so early in the morning. Vlain explained that all the monsters were gathering together in the cave, preparing for a huge battle. Questioning him further, he explained that this battle was somewhat unplanned and was basically being clubbed together because last night's big battle didn't go as planned. While the monsters had their share of fun, the players in the inn felt like they had wasted their time. The funny part was that they couldn't really complain because in a way I had been defending the inn and would be considered a hero in the game. I explained I definitely would not be seen as a hero, especially since I had just killed a noble this morning. Flynn found this news very amusing. He and most of the people who played monsters all really hated the nobles, and this was only good news to them. My gears turning, I asked for more details about the upcoming battle. This time, they wouldn't just be weak little rat folk. They were going as various types of giants, including trolls and ogre mages. Vlain was one of the few monsters who was actually good at casting spells, so he knew that he had been chosen to play the part of an ogre mage. Since he was a mage, he'd probably be put in charge of a small squadron, probably of younger monsters. I then told him what I was planning. He stopped me short, telling me that most of the monsters would not agree to doing anything like that, because they knew that a monster's role was not to kill, but be killed. I felt disheartened for a second, before Vlain also explained there were definitely a few monsters, if not a few players, who would want nothing more than to help me accomplish my goals. We planned quickly. The huge battle would take a lot of preparation, about two hours or so. During that time, Flynn would talk to some of the younger monsters that he thought would be on my side. He said that was a pretty easy step, since I had managed to get a lot of respect through killing so many rat folk by myself. After that, he himself would go on patrol, using the freedom of being a monster to look for players. He would then lead them to me. Within an hour, there were six teenagers sitting around me inside a wooden glen. Asking them a few questions, it became clear that they hated the nobles, not just ones from all six houses. They told me themselves that they heard I had defended the inn despite being a fugitive, none of them realising that all I did was stop the nobles from having a chance to show off. Thankfully, whether or not they were trustworthy didn't matter. I explained what I wanted them to do, handing them each a gold piece. I promised them another if things went as planned. I met up with Vlain 15 minutes before the big battle was supposed to start, and he said that everything was ready. He even said that he had gone one step further than we had planned, and managed to convince a particular person to join us. It was the guy who I had been forced to resort to relying on strategical advantages in order to defeat. After that first battle where he had figured out how to use the low stance to counter my attacks, I received the chance to fight him several more times. He was easily one of the most skilled fighters that was here and it was only towards the end of that night that I felt like I had grown to be able to fight him purely with skill. Even by then though, I felt that had we both been outfitted with the same weapon, I would have lost each time. Vlain then explained that that man was going to be playing a summoned air elemental, a creature that could walk right past the shield wall by just saying that he was flying. This meant that the battle could very quickly turn into the perfect situation for me, as he ran back to the cave in order to get his costume on. I ran towards the large field where the battle would take place. I move into the woods that lined the field, preparing a makeshift blind to conceal my position. What I needed to do now was just watch and wait until the perfect moment presented itself. The two armies soon gathered at opposite ends of the field. The giants were organised in loose squads and were clearly outnumbered almost two to one. However, that was only in reality. While in the fantasy world, there were more giants than there were players. When a giant would fall, he would go to the edge of the woods, wait a few seconds, and then come back as a new giant. Typically, they had a set number of times they respawn, depending on how strong of a giant they were, with weaker giants respawning more times than stronger giants. However, this number would likely change as the battle went on, as the old man, the battle coordinator, would see how many mages still could cast spells on the player's side. If there were only a handful of mages left, the coordinator would just tell the monsters to stop respawning, and the battle would soon be over. Everything was geared in the players' favour, and there was absolutely no chance that they would lose. The players were organised by noble house. Those who were not a part of a noble house were constricted into one for the duration of the battle. 
Their strategy was simple. The warriors would form a shield wall, with the mages behind them as support. A few of the noble warriors were already in the front lines, with pocket mages already behind them. They would just let the waves of giants crash into the shield lines, which would undoubtedly hold. The strong warriors would never fall because of their pocket mages, while the weaker warriors would just be replaced as they fell. Everything about the battle seemed to have already been decided. I spotted Ulsic, safely in the back, with a large entourage. Among them I spotted Harjal, Lith, and even Selina and her newly resurrected boyfriend. Knowing that that could turn into a very complicated situation, I hoped that the battle would press the entourage to spread out. As the battle began, the air quickly filled with shouts. The nobles shouted orders at the other players, while the giants simply shouted. I watched intently, seeing the players shift around, until I saw what I was looking for. Six players, with shields forming a line, were directly in front of Vlain's squad of giants. I stood up and walked out of the forest, behind the players' forces. Vlain, who had been fighting lazily, spotted me, and with a great shout, lifted his staff into the air with both hands. Responding to this signal, the six players moved out and into the sides, forming a massive gap directly in the centre of the shield wall formation. Ignoring those six, Vlain and his squad marched right past the shield wall, striking down mage after mage. It all happened in an instant. The scripted battle, with its foretold conclusion, turned into absolute chaos. The players tried at first to close the gap, but the other monsters knew an advantage when they saw one. They poured into the gap, striking the almost completely defenceless mages, dropping one after the other. With no healer support, the front line began to crumble, and a complete rout seemed likely. That was until Ulsic and the other nobles decided to step up. With a single spell, Ulsic obliterated Vlain's entire squadron, stopping the spearhead formation that had managed to create such a large gap. As he continued to throw spells with abandon, the other nobles began activating their special abilities. Some became invisible, others exploded in damage, and one managed to revive ten of the mages who had fallen. The battle quickly turned against the giants, who were pressed back until the shield wall re-established itself. I watched all this with anticipation. No one seemed to notice me, or at least they didn't seem to care about me. No one except Lith. As soon as he spotted me, he knew my intentions. He moved towards me, away from Ulsic, and confronted me. There was no point in words. This wasn't a matter that concerned House Ulsic or his game. All that mattered was that this was a rematch. A moment for Lith to restore his lost honour. As he moved towards me, I threw an ice spell at him, hoping to pin his legs. Without flinching, he simply replied, Minor immunity! and continued forward. This was fine by me, being immune to all low level spells, which were all of my spells, made this into a straight sword fight. The only thing that irked me was that it was most likely Ulsa who had cast it on Lith. But even that meant one less spell Ulsa could cast today. We were a bit of a distance away from the rest of the battle, and while I desperately needed to pay attention to it, I couldn't afford to. Lith was earnestly trying to kill me, and this time I was ready to respond in kind. He had not been through what I had been through. His sword was slow in comparison to the daggers I had faced, and his shield seemed to trouble him more than me. My sword sang, slicing through the air and then into his leg, and again into his shoulder. He was shocked when he heard me call out seven damage, and now he was as best as two hits away from dying. He didn't say a word though, and charged forward, slamming me with his shield. I fell back, not expecting the legal strike, but complimenting him on his willingness to use it. He wasn't holding anything back, and I was glad he decided to take this so seriously. As he tried again to slam a shield into me, I used all my strength to whip my sword into his. Disarming him and tossing his sword away, I followed the blow with a light tap on his shoulder before letting him pick up his sword. Three times seven was twenty-one, while he only started with twenty-two health. With his single HP left, I decided to remind him of our earlier battle by telling him to run off to the inn to find a healer. These might have been some kind of magic words. As soon as I said them, he shouted, threw down his shield and leapt at me with a sword, leaving his front leg exposed. With a perfect fading strike, I dealt the seven damage to his leg before stepping out of the way of his blow that was assuredly aimed at my head. As soon as I delivered the damage, he just smiled. That was a good fight, he said simply, before dropping ceremoniously to the ground. Moving past him, I saw that our fight had gone unnoticed. Selena, attached to your boyfriend, were heading my way. This was not a fight I wanted to deal with, especially not when I was supposed to be paying attention to a bigger battle. 
but the boyfriend was not going to let his assassin just walk away. He came swinging, and I wondered how he had survived in this game. He swung his two-handed sword almost as if the sword was swinging him. Realising that he was the first player I was going to fight after going through all the monsters and even Lith, I didn't even feel as much joy as I did a sense of tedium. I struck him again and again and again, wondering how he expected to hit me. He was calling out 12 points of damage with each strike, but I was not worried in the slightest. After hitting him 10 times, he called Selina to come heal him. As she did, I asked if she could save a heal spell to heal Lith. As she agreed, her boyfriend grew furious, which made his attacks all the wilder. Ignoring every rule, he seemed intent on chopping off my head with a silly looking sword. I kept attacking him, until I had hit him another 10 times. After Selina healed him again, she then ran off towards Lith, leaving the two of us alone. Without restraint, I whipped my sword onto him, literally shifting him left and right with each blow, until he simply dropped. Picking up his sword and seeing no ribbons on it, I just tossed it away from him, to give him a little trouble if someone decided to revive him but not wanting to use a finishing blow on him to kill him outright. As I surveyed the battle, it seemed like the player's shield wall was doing its job, and the giants were in a bad situation. Spotting Vlaine, I waved my sword at him. With another shout and a raise of his staff, the shield wall once again parted and chaos returned. Looking on in satisfaction, I turned to look at Ulsic, who now had a worried look on his face. As I stood there, basking in his moment of despair, I was struck hard in the back of my head for 12 points of damage. Turning around, I saw the boyfriend standing there, and I looked around for any sign of a healer. With none that could be found, I realised what he had done. He had dropped to the ground while he still had HP left, only pretending to have fallen. Thanks to the naivety that allowed me to fall for such a simple trick, I only had 2 HP left. I don't think I really cared all that much about how much HP I had at that moment. With the back of my head throbbing slightly, I struck him hard in the hands, not even bothering to call out damage, as his sword dropped slightly. I began to rain down hits on his shoulder. He dropped after only four, but I continued to poke his body until I was sure he had taken over 300 points of damage, to make sure he wasn't faking this time. I then performed a coup de grace, and watched as he stood up and ran off the battlefield. Looking around, I saw that everyone was preoccupied with the giants. The hole in the shield wall was no longer closing, and it was hard to tell if there were any mages left standing beside the strongest of nobles. Looking towards Ulsic, I saw Harjul standing close by him, fending off trolls with his fire spells. Finally, I saw what I had been looking for. Ulsic made a very specific motion, a sideways chop that he continued to do until the old man in charge of the monsters began to move around and issue new orders. Ulsic was low on spells. As soon as that signal was sent out, I sent an identical one at flame. Rather than raising his staff with both arms, he raised it high with one and shouted, calling forth the air elemental. Even when dressed and acting like a rat person, he had been intimidating. Now, dressed in a tattered grey cloak, dark grey makeup, and a grizzled grey wig, carrying two huge foam sickles, his appearance was more than enough to drain what little hope the players had. The air elemental ripped people apart, carving a line through the players as they dropped before his sickles. The nobles panicked. The warrior had long lost their pocket mages and were relying on their own HP. The mages had used all their most powerful spells and were using their items as if they actually feared for their lives. Ulsic, though, looking somewhat stressed, appeared to be still capable of flinging spell after spell, dropping down giants. Finally, as the air elemental drew near to him, he cast out a death spell, slaying the elemental instantly. With that, he stopped casting. I moved forward. Knowing that now was my chance, using my three healing spells, I returned to 14 HP. I looked to see what was left of House Ulsic, and was pleased that only Hargill and Ulsic himself had not fled back to the inn, or were lying face down in the grass. The other noble houses were preoccupied with the remaining giants, leaving me and them apart from the rest of the battle. As Ulsic spotted me, his tiny eyes grew wide. Looking at my hands, he pointed to them, shouting, The ring! He has the ring of wish! Looking down at my finger, at the piece of cheap plastic I had completely forgotten about, I realised why he had placed such a large bounty on my head. Ulsic probably didn't care in the slightest about me being free. What he cared about was the unique ring I had taken from the chest. And if he cared about it that much, my only guess was that it was obscenely powerful. Putting that matter aside, Hargill stepped in between us, throwing his 10 damage spell at me. 
I blocked it easily with my sword. He looked at me strangely at first, until I showed him the other ring I had. He continued to throw spells at me, forcing me to dodge and block, with a precision I did not expect from him. Though I tried to get close to him, he kept forcing me back, with a nearly endless amount of spells. As I tried to follow his eyes, I suddenly saw him glance behind me. Turning around slightly to see, I saw Lith, his sword ready, sandwiched between my two friends. With my truest goal just beyond them, I realised everything was for nothing. As Lith attacked me, Harjo threw spells at my back, forcing me to dodge and roll just to stay alive. Finally, as Lith managed to catch my sword between his sword and shield, Harjo hit me with a spell for 10 damage. Even so, I knew that if I could just drop Lith, I still had a chance. Ulsic stole that chance from me. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw him throw a beanbag at me. Instinctively, reflectively, without a single thought in my head, I batted it with my sword as I connected with it. I could only scream with rage when I realised what that terrible, horrible man had cast. Shatter. It dropped my no longer existent sword. The sword that I had brought with me all this way. Just as Lith swung at me for my four damage, I dropped. Slowly, painfully. Wondering if they would just let me bleed dry or if they would finish me off. My face in the dirt. I could feel tears welling up. Knowing that I had been so close, yet I couldn't even hit Ulsic once. Ulsic was hysterical. He ran up to Lith and Hargel, hugging them and complimenting himself on his brilliant final spell. He laughed at me, telling me I had been foolish to oppose him, and that he had saved that spell just for someone like me. He promised both Hargel and Lith peerage, even joking that after this battle there would probably be a lot of vacancies. Hargel, overjoyed, asked Ulsic if it had really been his final spell that had finished me off. Ulsic laughed, saying that he was bone dry out of magic and was right now nothing more than walking sack of HP. What luck, he said, that it was his last spell that had taken me down. With the truest ring of happiness in his voice, Hargel said he had waited seven years for this. Hargel often made bad decisions. That's who he was. Left to his own devices. He will almost always come up with the absolute worst ideas and thinking reasonably, logically, this was probably his worst one. He started casting spells at Ulsic. Lith didn't miss a beat. Swinging his sword in a flurry, Ulsic, absolutely bewildered first, tried to understand what was going on. When that failed, he tried to run. But I doubt the man had run in the last 30 years. Hargel and Lith chased after him, but didn't have to run far before Ulsic dropped. As I watched wide-eyed in shock from the ground, I suddenly felt a hand at my back. Selina healed me for four hit points. And with a word of thanks, I leapt up, rushing over to where Lith and Harjo were standing over Ulsic. Mouth gaping open, I looked at Harjo as if he had gone mad. He looked at me as if he had planned this for years. Smugger than a Cheshire cat, I knew full well that he had spontaneously decided to kill Ulsic when he realised he no longer had any power. Lith as well, whose true allegiance remained unknown, if he ever had one. Tried to act like he had been the one guiding me through all this. Selina walked over to us. Smiling for a reason I doubt I'll ever understand. Beyond her, it seemed like everyone was still more interested in killing the remainder of the giants than to notice that we had just slain one of the most powerful players in the game. One man did notice though. The old man in charge of the monsters ran over, looking down at her feet. He asked how much time had passed. Lith, with a sudden realisation, bent down to begin the coup de grace procedure, as normally as if he were just bending down to tie his shoe. The old man just stared in shock before he noticed the ring on my finger. Ignoring the pretend murder happening right in front of him, he gasped as he asked what I was doing with the ring of wish. I told him how I came across it, and then asked him what it did. He said it was one of the most powerful items in the game, with the power to grant its bearer a single wish. I knew what my heart desired, or at least what my character's heart desired. I doubt anyone in the circle, omitting Ulsic, would have stopped me. I guess the one good thing about people that were easy to hate was that you were rarely alone in hating them. I asked the old man if I could wish someone's character to be dead forever. The old man laughed, saying there was no need, as characters could only die a certain amount of times that decreased each level. And Ulsic was the highest level character in the game. With a bit of disappointment, I removed the ring, tossed it to Hargel, and went off, back into the woods to be a fugitive. A little while later, it was time for the event to end. Ulsic, who was supposed to preside over the closing ceremonies, could not be found. Instead, the old man told us what an amazing event it was, and how the players had just barely managed to turn back the most fearsome horde ever to attack. 
Solemnly, he then began to list people who had died permanently, sacrificing themselves for the good of all. 14 people, an astonishing amount, had permanently died. 12 had been nobles and 6 of them had been from House Ulsic, leaving only one alive. With a grave tone, he also said that Archduke Ulsic had mysteriously been killed by assassins, though everyone shot a glance at our table. After a moment of silence, he continued on with the ceremony. After everything was cleaned up and packed into cars, we chatted with some of the players before we left. Very few approved of what we had done, but that was more than fine, since it helped us know which people were miserable and which one wasn't. Vlain said he really hoped to see us there again, or perhaps we could start a tabletop campaign. The guy who had been the Air Elemental also was fairly cool, saying he really wanted to fight against me again. Every teenager there though thought that we three were the coolest guys they had ever met, and all of them wanted to be a part of the newly formed House Cerberus. Selena seemed interested in joining in on Vlain's tabletop campaign, and we managed to exchange email addresses before her boyfriend, whose character could never be resurrected, grumpily dragged her away, berating her for hanging out with regicidal maniacs. Ulsic, or the man formerly known as Ulsic, when he finally appeared, tried to smile and laugh and accept his death in a noble fashion, but our grins were almost too much for him to take. He ended up finding consolement in the fat warrior woman, who I had completely forgotten about until I hear her name and the list of people that had died. She looked at me with absolute disgust, and I relish her revilement. As we drove home, Hargill explained that he had always hated Ulsic, and half the reason he wanted to be noble was so that he could eventually kill the man. I half believed him, but was more willing to believe that he just had a wouldn't it be awesome thought and ran with it. Lith was glad that Hargill had wished to start a noble house, and was more than happy to remind me that he had been the one that dropped me in our third and final battle. They then asked me my story, which took the entire rest of the car ride to tell. I don't know if I'll ever go back. More than likely not. Ulsic would use every bit of his power just to try and ruin my day if I ever returned, but I would be lying if I didn't say I had fun. And while there may be more than bad times than good, I was still glad I had gone. Maybe if the other two decide to go, I'll tag along.